shoot the host i am so sorry um my nickname on expeditions was techno idiot because i am a technology idiot when it comes to a chip and social media so i see that a lot of you folks are finding the correct link now that was totally my bad as usual but i appreciate you coming back um, hope others can find the new show, <laughs> Tech Rocks. Yeah, I don't when it comes to tech, John. Um, so today we're going to jump in and um, go back over some more um, how to make photographs scientifically valid. And um, I'm going to quickly, for any newcomers, I think I see one here. Um, quickly go over a few of the points from the last show and then jump into the main focus, which is giving specific examples of how to do this tonight. So um, I'm probably going to cut the reading a little short, but I do want to read a little bit more from the scientific Bible, as I call it. Um Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. We're going to be picking up on page 141 in his story about, hey, Sharon, thanks for making it back, about the, um, um, the Patterson-Gimlin sighting. We started this last week and we'll continue this week. Gimlin described his initial impressions of the creature's size and weight. I thought it was about six and a half feet tall, and I would have guessed it weighs 250 to 300 pounds. It did have tremendous mu muscle bulk. It was massive. This was an estimated guess at the time. Of course, I'm not used to seeing things like that. I was just guessing weight compared to the amount of muscle quarter horses have. I, it wasn't as big. It wasn't as big as a quarter horse naturally, and the height. Because we were up on our horses at the time, we we first saw the creature. It probably didn't look as tall as it really was. Now, my the horse I was riding was six, a sixteen hand horse. One hand is four inches on a horse, and so um, that's sixteen and a half hands high now of course with me sitting up there you can figure my eye level was about nine feet high so anything actually less than nine feet you'd be looking down at it these were gimlin's initial impressions but after examining footprints deeply impressed in the firm sand confirmed um, compared to the shallow hoof prints left by the horses he reconsidered we might we knew it had to be heavier than it appeared to be when we first saw it. The horse I was riding was around 12 to 1300 pounds. I rode him alongside the tracks 
with the new film cr film in the camera, Roger took the pictures of how deep the horse's track prints were in the soil compared to the creature's tracks. Of course, we thought the horse weight was distributed on all four feet, and I'm not good with mathematics, um, such things, but I figured a 1,400-pound horse on four feet would be about 350, 400 pounds. So we figured it must have weighed much more than we orig originally figured. Then I got up on a stump, which I was, which was approximately three to four feet. We didn't measure it, probably should have. Anyway, I jumped off with a high heel boot as close to the track as we could. Then we took pictures to illustrate the depth of my footprint went, that my footprint went into the dirt with a high heel cowboy boot. And at that time, I weighed 165 pounds. Of course, Roger did some research by going over to the um, zoo in Seattle, watched the gorillas there and asked how much they weighed and so forth. They had over, they had one named Bobo. And I don't remember his weight exactly, but I do remember he weighed more than it looked like he weighed. In the end, it probably weighed approximately 500 pounds to make tracks that deep in the dirt. It wasn't looking directly at me, but I could see the face real good and I could see the eyes. Gimlin recalled describing their initial encounter with the creature. As for the details of its face, the face would have been a flat type no flat type nose. The lips, I can't really remember what the lips look like, except it did have lips and we could see its teeth. The eyes were large teeth, but not big round eyes like a horse or a cow, but they were large eyes. The hair on its face was short. There wasn't a whole lot of hair around its cheeks and down alongside the face. The best I can remember is the face didn't have a whole lot of hair on it. The creature walked away with an easy motion, swinging, uh, swinging its arms like a human. Gimlin, familiar with livestock, was especially impressed by the evident and dynamic musculature. Yes, I could see the muscles clearly, and that was one of the deciding factors, in my opinion, that this was no man in a suit. The thighs, the buttocks, the arms, the shoulders, you could see it move clearly underneath the hair. Regarding the creature's gender, he continued, well, it appeared to be female, but you know, I've never seen one. I never even seen a track until that day, so I couldn't even make a statement whether it was male or female, but the film indicates it had mammary glands, and so we assumed it was a female. Since the tracks found earlier on Blue Creek Mountain were of three different sizes, Patterson and Gimlin had assumed there were a male, a female, and a younger one in the area. In retrospect, the three were probably a female and two offspring, perhaps even the female they encountered. The prospect of the possibility of two more enormous creatures being in the vicinity, perhaps even a larger male, was a bit disconcerting. Gimlin was in the vicinity, perhaps an even large male, but Gimlin was in the vicinity, careful to ensure his horse didn't bolt from the scene. He continued, It was moving away from me. That was about all was, that was in my mind at the time that this creature was no threat to us. And, oh, yeah, I was trying to keep my horse under control because, you know, I never had any idea what happened, and I sure didn't want to be on foot. So I knew I could get back on my horse if I had to. I had to, if I had to shoot it and it didn't go down, I could get on my horse and get out of there. And Roger would have had to offend, fend for himself. I'm not a coward, but I'll be darned if I was going to stick around if this creature got violent, you know. So I was concentrating on keeping my rifle in hand and my horse under control. We're going to stop there and get into the show.
I have never met Bob Gimlin. Um, I'm sure I'm doing more of a North Carolina accent than a Texas accent. So I apologize for that, but add a little color to the story nonetheless. So for new folks this week, um, we're looking at are most Bigfoot photos scientifically worthless or can you, can you learn to uh, make them scientific, basically, is what it boils down to. Last week, validity. Are we measuring what we think we're measuring? Reliability. Can we measure what we're measuring reliably over and over and over again and measure the same thing? We're not going to go into coincidence or correlation or causality. Photos. For our discussion yes, last week and this week, photos include still photos, video, FLIR, um, any kind of um, thermal or night vision. Um, basically went over some of the what makes photos and videos weak. It's an analog of reality, not reality. It's one step removed. Typically, people only use one camera. Typically, it's a single exposure, be a long one, be it a long one in the in a video camera, or um, one or two shots um, with a camera. Electronic digital cameras, guys, go low tech. Um, it makes too many decisions for you, especially the focus feature. If you're not focused on your on your subject accurately, it will zoom in past your subject, and that may contribute to blurriness. It, um, digital is also more malleable, easy to manipulate, fake, alter post-exposure, where film is more difficult to do that with. And, of course, the electronic digital cameras have infrared, and um, it would appear that possibly Bigfoot can sense in infrared. Um, the photos are typically used independent of any experimental design and the solution to that is what we're going to focus on today you got to use the these instruments as part of an experimental design to make them scientific a few definitions blind double blind designs um, a blind design is when the subject doesn't know what's being studied or what the independent variable is. The independent variable being what manipulation you're using. Are you using tree knocks, stone clacks, gifting, baiting? The B in the AB design is the dependent variable. We're measuring what influence um, that independent variable has on the dependent variable, or in this case, Bigfoot. An ABA design, your first condition is typically either ba is baseline, B, you make your intervention, a tree knock, for example, and then you go back to baseline and just monitoring. Counterbalance designs, a, B, B, A is you flipping the order of the variables. And uh, this reminds me as I'm rushing through this. Um, next week, we'll start with a two-hour length show for the first time. We're going to be starting at 6 p.m. and going until 8 if we need the time. Um, if we don't need the time, open it up for questions. Some other special stuff is planned in the future. But next week, beginning next week, and here to four, we'll be starting at six rather than seven o'clock. Still going to around eight. So how to, how to use prime, how to use your photos and your photo equipment primarily as part of an experimental design? You've got to design quantitative experiments to test your equipment. Quantitative means using numbers. The, by far, the majority of the research done with Sasquatch has been qualitative. We're looking at phenomena and then trying to capture that phenomena. And that can be part of a quantitative experiment. And that's the good news 
about the research that has been done so far. We've gotten excellent at catching Bigfoot phenomena. And we can study that phenomena, but code it into numbers to shoot that target, shoot at that target to try and hit that bullseye on Bigfoot. Um, but before you start using your equipment, and again, thank you, Craig, for these points, um, you want to test and do experiments with your equipment. Do you get better results when you position your tree, your um, trail cam low, medium, or high up the tree? Try all three positions, see what gets you better results. You can then analyze those results statistically. And again, as I said last week, I think this is where the Bigfoot community breaks down. We don't understand, we don't know how to do statistics. I would strongly recommend before you buy your next FLIR or your next night vision or your next drone that you consider investing some of that money into a statistical program. I like SPSSX, Social Science, uh, Social Science Statistical Program. Um, because it allows you to measure things that psychologists can measure. And since we're measuring un thing, uh, un unquantifiable things, and I shouldn't say unquantifiable, we're measuring things that directly can't be quantified. The examples I've used in the past is you can't directly measure intelligence. You can't put a sensor in somebody's brain and figure out how smart they are but you can measure the phenomena of intelligence, the readings or the writings that people do, the art that people produce, the architecture that people produce, the verbalizations and their thinking. All these are phenomena of intelligence. It's the same with emotions. You can't directly measure love. You can't directly measure hate. Any emotion is occurring inside the person's mind and body, and you can't get in there with a camera and see. So what? why psychology works so well is because we can measure the phenomena associated with emotions in a variety of different ways and end up hitting the target on what that emotion is. And, and that's, why, that's why you're trying to... Um, that's what we're trying to do with Bigfoot. Bigfoot's hard to see, hard to touch, hard to feel, but its phenomena are readily more available. And that would be one tip for people using cameras and hoping to get scientific results from the cameras. We're all worked up on trying to get photos of Bigfoot. I think today there are two what widely known photos or videos, that being the Patterson-Gimlin film and the Freeman footage that have gained general acceptance as valid measures of, of Bigfoot. But again, it's not the real thing, and that's part of why science rejects pictures. I made this point last week. Think about the hurdles that, the Patterson-Gimlin film should have overcome. We got an anecdotal sighting, the stories from the observers. We've got video of the event itself. We've got casts of the footprints, video of the footprints, casts of the footprints. And those footprints have been validated by Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who's considered the foremost authority on um, the validity of Bigfoot prints and casts. And so we've got a good four data points from that one film, and yet we're not close to having it being scientifically accepted. And I believe that one of the reasons that we're not close to having it scientifically accepted 
is because the, the language of science is numbers. If we had been converting the subjective and objective phenomena of Bigfoot, the footprints, the foot casts, the sounds that we hear, if we had been subjecting them to reducing them to numeric data and then analyzing that data 60 years ago, if we wouldn't have pr been able to prove Bigfoot by now, um, we would have been a lot further than we are. But the current research model is we just look for those phenomena and then offer them up as proof of Bigfoot. Science will never accept that. The language of science is math. And so we've got to be able to convert our raw data, the phenomena of Bigfoot that you can record on your camera or your audio recorder. We've got to be able to convert that to numeric data to quantify it and compare it to other things. And to that degree, audio is ahead of the game in terms of photography because we're already at a point where audio experts can detect infrasound. They can map or look at the signature of a Bigfoot vocalization and distinguish it from that of a bear or a cat or a human. Um, so while it's important to get a photo of Bigfoot, the phenomena of Bigfoot are more readily available and are going to get us there quickly if we can understand how to set up an experiment and then understand how to run a statistical package. And again, I think how to set up an experiment isn't that tough. Um, getting people to get a grasp of what statistics to use when and how to analyze that numeric data, I think is the big hurdle that as a community of researchers, we've got to get past. So you've got to design quantitative experiments to investigate Sasquatch. Concurrent validity. Use two different cameras, a FLIR and a regular um, camera that can pick up at night or during the day, well, night since we're talking FLIR, and bring those two cameras to bear either on the phenomena or on Bigfoot. So now we've got two data points in one possible experiment, and they're being recorded at the same time. Um, convergent validity is when you get one data point in one study, and you get another data point in another study, and both of them converge on either Bigfoot itself or Bigfoot phenomena. And then divergent validity. That's when one data point shows or refers to Bigfoot, but another data point shows to something other than Bigfoot. So you can rule out the the extraneous variables, so you can rule out the variables that don't fit. Because not only do we want to show that it's Bigfoot or Bigfoot phenomena, but if something isn't Bigfoot or Bigfoot phenomena, we also need to capture that to further strengthen that what we were measuring with the other camera was in fact Bigfoot. In other words, design and perform an a priori designed experiment to collect relevant evidence. Follow the scientific method to one of its two conclusions in your study. A priori. A priori is a fancy way of saying developing a hypothesis before you go out into the woods. I think most people, the hypothesis that they develop is. Um, 
you know, we're, we're, we're going out there and we're trying to capture Bigfoot on a camera. Okay. So, or we're going to go out there and try and capture Bigfoot phenomena on a camera. But you've got to develop a hypothesis ahead of time. If we make um, the hypothesis, for example, that tree, um, tree knocks provoke a response from Bigfoot. So our, our, our hypothesis is making a, a tree knock sound in the woods will provoke a tree knock sound back from Bigfoot. And last week we talked about how we already know that that's a co-relationship, a correlational relationship. It's not that Bigfoot causes the tree knocks or we cause Bigfoot to make a tree knock. Because in a causal relationship, it's 100% of the time. Every time you make a tree knock, Bigfoot responds. And we know that doesn't happen as often. Um, I forgot to say, if you got any questions, um, put them in caps. Craig, I'm going to put something up that I just saw from you. And how often do you check them? You know, Doug Hycheck and I were talking about this. He has a new feature on technology and equipment on his show. And, you know, he, he, I would call him an expert, much more of an expert for sure, on video and photography cameras. You know, he's a, he's a, a producer. He knows what he's talking about. And he too, like I did last week in M here, is advocating Keep it simple, stupid. Go low tech so that you have more control over what your camera picks up and what you're focusing on. But we've become reliant on these long delayed recorders. One of his suggestions was check them a day, two at the most. I, I don't even think he said two. We're setting these things out there and leave them out for weeks or months. On every expedition that I've been on, we're out there starting at 9 o'clock, and depending on activity, it may be 4 o'clock in the morning until we get back if we're having good activity. So set your camera up right when you go out, move on to another location, and then at the end of the night, come back and check it. Come back and gather your data. Um, with trail cams, I think they are now producing them without infrared triggers. But, you know, hide out. Hide your camera and hide out so that you can keep an eye on your camera and let that be your expedition for the night um but how to make your a let's see where are you craig let's see i saw another interesting john buy a browning and a stealth cam link both will last well over a year or one of one set of batteries depending on your um, settings. Yeah, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that Bigfoot is intelligent. A lot of people talk about how intelligent Bigfoot is. I think that needs to be studied before we start tossing around a, a term like intelligent, because we could be easily mistake, be mistaking instincts or instincts on steroids and calling it intelligence. These creatures have been around for a long time. They know how to survive in the forest. And so, if you're going to go high tech, go small. You know, even creatures that you wouldn't assume have 
as high of intelligence or high as high of instincts towards humans as Bigfoot would, like deer. You can see deer see the trail cam. If a deer can pick up on the trail cam, you better believe a Bigfoot is, infra infrared or not. Okay? But now they're making cameras smaller and smaller. And you could, you know, conceal that camera real well. And then also, again, getting back to convergent or concurrent validity, excuse me, you could set up a video recorder tucked well away in the ground just so that the microphone is po poking up. Conceal it in the leaves. And then you'd have both audio evidence and photographic evidence at the same time. But now to jump on, jump into the meat of what I, what I wanted to talk about, this last comment. Follow the scientific method to one of its two conclusions to your study. How do you make your photographs and video scientific? Do science. Follow the scientific method. And here it is. You make an observation. Um, you ask a question. You formulate a hypothesis. Okay? We're jumping from asking a question to a theory. Before you can call something a theory, you have to run experiments to test it as a hypothesis. And if your tests don't come out validating that hypothesis, there's no way it should be called a theory. So you formulate your hypothesis. If, if I um, leave a donut out on a stump with a hidden camera, I predict that Bigfoot is going to come to the food. So you set up that experiment and you test that hypothesis. You put out, you put out a feed, you make a feeding station. Oftentimes people just use stumps. Hide different cameras from different angles or hide a regular um, night vision camera on one side and a flare from another side so that you can capture, if a Bigfoot's coming in, capture that Bigfoot coming in from different directions. And then you've got two forms of validity. You've got two forms, two ca different cameras showing that you are in fact measuring Bigfoot and not something else. But here comes the big one. Now you've tested that prediction, but now you've got to analyze that data. So if you put out a donut one time and you don't get any Bigfoot in, and then the next time you put out a jar of peanut butter, and you get a big foot in, then you begin to test the hypothesis that peanut butter is has a greater preference for Bigfoots than donuts do. And then if the donut gets taken, that's assigned a number one. If the peanut butter gets taken, that's assigned a number two. So you're reducing the information down to numbers, and it's those numbers, when you repeat that experiment over and over and over again, eventually you'll have a bunch of numbers, let's say 50, 50 numbers, as to whether the Bigfoot's more attracted to the donut or to the peanut butter. And then you can compare the number of times Bigfoot was attracted to the donut, 
to the number of times that Bigfoot was attracted to the peanut butter. If you get a bunch of ones, you know it's the donut. You get a bunch of twos, you know it's the, uh, the peanut butter. But then you can run statistics on those one and two numbers, and not only just by looking at the frequency of those numbers, but by running a test called a t-test, you can see if there's a significant difference between the number of times the you got video on the Bigfoot going to the donut compared to going to the um, peanut butter. So if your prediction is the peanut butter and your experiment brings your experiment bears that out now we're here at the bottom of the page you reiterate that experiment you go up on the left hand side as i'm looking at the picture and the green line and you can see you write it up and you publish it it goes under peer review and then you rerun that study or other people rerun that study and see if they get the same results. So you observe that they got the, like the peanut butter better than the donut. Do Bigfoots like peanut, ask the question, do Bigfoots like peanut butter more than donuts? Um, form the testable hypothesis. The Bigfoot will go to the peanut butter more frequently than the donuts. That's your prediction. Test that prediction. And I think last week I'm, I, I provided an example where you can do this at the same time. You could even do it in the same area with timestamps on these, those, these videos. You could put a donut on a stump and then 50 yards away, Put a peanut butter jar on a stump. Have two cameras focused on each of them and then compare those results. You get more Bigfoots going to the donut, you get more Bigfoots going to the peanut butter. Let's say the second time that experiment is run, they don't go to the peanut butter more frequently they go to the donut more frequently. So your hypothesis is not confirmed. When your hypothesis is not confirmed, on the left there, you see iterate. Reiterate is when you've done something successful and you're going to repeat that whole approach identically the next time around. Iterate is when your results don't come out and you're not going to repeat that all those steps again because your hypothesis was not borne out. So you're going to go back up to the hypothesis set, not published, do not publish your results. You're going to go back up to test that hypothesis again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wasn't around when the, the, the donut joke um, John came up, so I don't completely understand that, but I do know um, that's a, a, an issue with Alex and his donuts. So when your hypothesis isn't borne out, you're going up the right side, the red side of the experimental method, and you're tweaking your experiment. You're forming a slightly different hypothesis, or you're tweaking your experimental design and see if your hypothesis is borne out in that way. So, and um, I'm not picking on um, finding the trackway. Um, keep in mind, deer have long tongues and their licking pattern can look like fingers. Surveillance is the key. Yeah, here we're talking about photography. We're talking about video, night vision, FLIR. And that's, that's where the science in the images that are produced by those recordings are going to be critical because they are 
proving that it was a Bigfoot that came and took that peanut butter and not a deer. Or they're going to be uh, divergent validity, providing evidence away from Bigfoot. They're going to show it's a deer that got into that peanut butter jar, and it wasn't Bigfoot. And that's just as important evidence as if it is Bigfoot. Because that then tells you you need to tweak your design in a different way. Maybe use a different container. Um, maybe use a different bait, if you will. Um, and I, I talked about this last week. One of the odd things about science, and I think probably one of its weaknesses or its biases, because all these techniques, be it science, be it um, collecting experiential data, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. One of the things I find interesting about science is they get crack after crack after crack to grab that apple or the golden ring. If your first experiment doesn't work out, you go up the right side, you don't publish it, you either form a testable hypothesis or you, or you alter your experimental design and you have another crack at it. And if that fails, you can go back and have another crack. There are some limits. Somebody asked this um, when I went over the scientific method. There are some limits how often you can take a crack at that one hypothesis um, before the number of times you're testing increases the likelihood that you're going to find the result that you're looking for. If you do that test five times, and you get donut rather than peanut butter, well, you might do it a few more. But if you do that a hundred times and only five times get um, peanut butter, eh, that's, that, 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 that's not a very likely or scientific result because you kept trying and trying and trying and trying. And there are actually formulas that will tell you how many attempts or how many passes you can make before, just by the odds of trying and trying and trying again, you're going to get the result you're looking for. You know, you flip a coin, supposed to be 50 50. Okay. But if you've ever done that, one side comes up a lot more frequently for a while before you get to 100 flips. And it doesn't always come out 50-50. So let's talk about another experiment in which um, photography could be used um, and provide scientific data. And again, this is one that I used in another show, but tree structures seem to be a, a, quite a big phenomena and people are putting a lot of stock into tree twists, tree breaks, teepees, nests, um, anything made from trees or leaves. And um, let's say you're trying to prove that that Bigfoot is making those um, those designs or those um, tree phenomena. But you want to prove Bigfoot is doing it rather than humans are doing it. Again, your camera becomes essential. Um, oftentimes, if you're out in the woods, and you can sometimes see this just driving through the woods, you'll see an area with a whole lot of tree structures. So you can go into that area where there are tree structures, photograph and count the number of tree structures in a grid that you can make up. You know, you're going to measure the number of tree structures in a 24 or 20 yard square area, a 20 yard square and see how many tree, 
structures are in there. Count them. Take a photograph. If you really want to get tricky, you can plant a camera, again, away from the site, but still hidden, but was still with a line of sight onto, onto the 20 square foot or 20 square yard, whatever you want to do, number of tree structures to capture if Bigfoot comes in and adds to those tree structures. To measure the human influence, you pick an area where Bigfoot is unlikely or definitely won't show up. You measure a 20-foot or 20-yard grid area. And you create a man-made, one man-made tree structure in that, in that square area. And then you position a camera and see how many other tree structures show up. How many are added to the human tree structures and compare those numbers to the number that were added to the Bigfoot tree structures. If you want to get tighten up that experiment, you could create a little TP structure amongst the Bigfoot structures, and you can use the same size TP structure in the human area where you're setting up a tree structure away from Bigfoot so that you're sure there's not going to be any Bigfoot influence. You set your cameras up, and again, you see how many other teepees or what happens with those teepee structures. The ones that you set up in a Bigfoot area are probably going to have your scent in it. Does anybody know what happens when a human sets up a structure in a Bigfoot area? What they do with that? I don't think we do. Does the Bigfoot come in there and make more tree structures? Does the Bigfoot come in there and destroy the human tree structure? Interestingly, when you look at the human area where you're monitoring the tree structures, what do the humans do? Do the humans go in there and destroy them or set more up and set or set up different ones? And then you compare your two tree structure groups. The human tree structure group compared to the Bigfoot tree structure group. And in compar comparing those two, we would hope that the Bigfoot adds more signific significantly more tree structures to their area than the humans do. Or do you capture humans going into the Bigfoot tree structures and setting them up? What happens with the tree structures in each respective area? And you're having your, your, you're using your cameras there to record and validate, scientifically validate that it's humans or Bigfoots doing these things. So you take the guesswork out of that. Real quick, um, one more, and this one's outlined in my book. What's more likely to produce a response from a Bigfoot? A tree knock or a whoop? So you go into an area, you make a single tree knock, you wait 15 minutes for a response. If no response comes in now, and again, this is audio, so I'm sorry I'm diverting away from camera here. But to help you understand the experimental design, you, you wait 15 minutes, record the number of knocks that come back from the tree knocks. Then you make a whoop. Wait 15 minutes, record the frequency of whoops or any other kind of Bigfoot response. Maybe they respond with a tree knock. Then you move on to your next site. 
but you reverse the order at your next site. At your next site, you make the whoop first and then the tree knock. Why? If you don't get a response within 10, 15 minutes in that first site to a tree knock and you make a whoop and no sooner you make a whoop, you get either a whoop or a tree knock back, you don't really know if it was a delayed response to the tree knock or whether it was the whoop that produced the response. So by switching the order of them, this is called a counterbalance design. By switching the order of that, you now make a whoop first and then a tree knock after 15 minutes and record your advice. And, you know, John, I'm not picking on you, bud, but John raises an interesting point. He says, I think a knock is a warning sign. Okay. That's an awesome hypothesis. It's not a theory, though. Because for something to be, become a theory, you've got to test that hypothesis over and over and over and have it confirmed. And if you have it confirmed frequently enough, then it can become a theory. So I think we're going to have to stop at that. I'd like to ramble on about how we could design that study. But we've come to the end of the show. Thank you very much for your attendance. Again, next week, 6 p.m. will be starting. More time to go slower, more time to answer questions, more time to relax and work in other things. Thank you very much for your attention. Please keep your mind open, your boots on the ground, and your heart with your higher power. Good evening. I see you running from the reason. Don't try to blame it on the season. Why you want to walk away When we began Swear we had something Something that would last Baby has a feeling fast Falling was easy I don't
me go back to the start I'll never let go of you Tried and true If you're in, meet me 